Good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome to the 110th Landon Lecture on Public Issues. The Landon Lectures were established in 1966 to honor Alfred M. Landon, former governor of Kansas, and a 1936 presidential candidate. This lecture series is a fitting tribute to the many, many contributions that Mr. Landon made to American public life. It is our privilege and honor to have as our speaker today, William S. Cohen, the United States Secretary of Defense. Before I introduce him, let me introduce other members of the platform party. On my left, Dr. Jim Legg, head of the Department of Physics and president of the Kansas State University Faculty Senate. <laughs> Next to him, Tim Riemann, a junior in agricultural economics and free law from Derby, Kansas, who is a Kansas State University student body president. Thanks, Tim. And over on my right, Edward Seaton, the publisher and editor-in-chief of the Manhattan Mercury and chairman of the Landon Patrons. Thank you. <laughs> then next to him, Dr. Charles Reagan, the chair of the Landon Lectures and my executive assistant. <laughs> I am also pleased and honored to introduce several other guests who are with us today. First, I would like to introduce to you, no stranger, U.S. Senator Pat Roberts. <laughs> and it's hard to use this word, but former U.S. Senator Nancy Kassebaum Baker. We're also very pleased to have our Congressman, Congressman Jim Ryan. Jim, there he is right over there. We are also pleased to have with us today Major General Michael Dodson of Fort Riley, Kansas. There he is. We're also pleased to have the Adjutant General James Rieger. Thank you. I also want to say that we're delighted that John Montgomery, former regent and now civilian aide for the Secretary of Defense here today, John Montgomery. And then we have several regents here with us today. Sid Warner and Phyllis Nolan. And then also, and finally, we're happy to have the Executive Director of the Board of Regents, Dr. Steve Jordan. William Cohen was sworn in as the 20th Secretary of Defense on January 24, 1997. Previously, as you probably remember, he served three terms in the United States Senate from the state of Maine and three terms in the House of Representatives. He has served on the Senate Armed Forces Committee and the Governmental Affairs Committee, as well as on the Select Committee on Intelligence. As a U.S. Senator, Secretary Cohen helped create the modern National Security Command structure by playing the leading role in crafting the Goldwater-Nichols Defense Reorganization Act of 1986. He co-authored legislation to overhaul U.S. counterintelligence and improve the congressional oversight of all intelligence activities. He was also a leading advocate for veterans education programs sponsoring the 1984 GI Bill. Secretary Cohn has been in the forefront of reforming the federal government's procurement process, especially in the Defense Department. He authored the Competition and Contracting Act of 1984 and 
performed a very important and key role in drafting the Federal Acquisition Reform Act of 1996. Throughout his distinguished career, Secretary Cohen has demonstrated outstanding leadership in U.S. foreign policy matters. He has led American delegations to a number of international security conferences and has cheered and served on groups at the Center for Strategic and International Studies and the School for Advanced International Studies. Secretary Cohen received a bachelor's degree from Bowdoin College and a law degree, cum laude, from the Boston University Law School. He has authored or co-authored eight books, including two books of poetry, three novels, and three works of nonfiction. It is a special honor for all of us at Kansas State University to have, as the 110th Landon Lecture, Secretary of Defense, William Cohen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mr. President, thank you very much for the generous uh, introduction. Uh, I am in uh, Kansas today on a military mission, but I've been hearing an awful lot about the Wildcat football coach, Bill, Bill Snyder. Four straight wins, uh, nine win series, right? Uh, four bowl appearances. I've been getting these statistics just fed to me as I came up here on the, on the platform. And my understanding is that uh, tomorrow you're going to have Military Appreciation Day and we're expecting a great uh, outpouring of support so that from Fort Riley uh, that's going to help generate an extra spirit necessary to beat Ohio. So that's uh, one of the messages I want to bring today. And of course, uh, Pat Roberts uh, told me I had to change my tie before I came up here. I was wearing a red and gold tie, and he said purple's the color, so I went out and changed it quickly. <laughs> but I, uh, I'd like to uh, express to you uh, what a great honor it is for me to, uh, to have you invite me. Senator Kassenbaum Baker um, invited me uh, to this, uh, this lecture. I wanted to know, her to know what a... a great deal of pride I take in, in being here today to see this enormous turnout that is not mandatory attendance, I'm told. But to uh, count my name among the Landon lecturers, former presidents, world leaders, great orators, and um, also to note uh, what a pleasure it is for me to be in the presence of some really fine, outstanding Kansas public servants. I mentioned uh, Senator Nancy Kassenbaum Baker. I'll have more to say about her in a moment. Uh, Senator Pat Roberts, a former Marine who has made a very significant mark in the United States Senate on the Senate Armed Services Committee in just a very few months. You've been introduced to Congressman Jim Ryan, who uh, has run for glory as a great athlete and all, also now as a great congressman who serves on the National uh, Security Committee in the House of Representatives. And I spoke yesterday to Senator Bob Dole, who was a hero of mine, whose military experience and service is well known to all of you and who remains a very close friend of mine. Uh, he asked me if I might try to get a check cash while I was uh, in Kansas. <laughs> and I told him I'd see what I could do. And I spent the morning with uh, your very talented governor, uh, Bill Graves. And in view of this distinguished company, I must tell you I feel like that traditional Missouri mule that was entered in the Kentucky Derby. <laughs> no one expected him to win, but they all knew he'd benefit from the association. And I hope to benefit from the association of being here with you today. Now, it's traditional for one to begin with a tribute to Alf Landon, but I am hard pressed to improve upon that of my predecessors. And I know that having been in Washington for more than two decades, that the words recede while the actions endure. And the greatest tribute to Governor Landon, I know, is the enduring legacy of his daughter, my friend and former Senate colleague, Nancy Kassenbaum Baker. Uh, her service uh, to Kansas and to America has always been about the public good, about telling people what they have to know and not just what they want to hear. Courage, conviction, independence, intelligence, and integrity, those are the unique combination of qualities I think that were obvious to everyone from the first moment that she walked through the United States Senate chamber doors. And I just want to say what a pleasure it is uh, for me to be here to pay a special tribute to her and to recognize what she said from this podium last year. She said, I believe that we possess the humility to know that God gave none of us a monopoly on truth or wisdom and to work together in respect for one another. 
And so earlier this year, when issues of gender integrated training suddenly erupted and caught the public's attention, the very first call I made was to none other than to Nancy Casabon Baker, saying, Nancy, I've got a problem, and I need your help. And she didn't hesitate one moment. Uh, she said yes without any hesitation, and her panel's work is underway, and they will be uh, recommending to me uh, some recommendations to me for me to present to the Congress uh, by the end of the year. Now, I heard uh, when President Weifold was first arrived in Kansas State in 1986, he went to meet Alf Landon. And he asked Governor Landon uh, who he thought the greatest American president of the 20th century was thus far. And without missing a single beat, the governor said, no doubt about it, it was FDR. The same FDR who defeated Alf Landon for the presidency. And so this legacy of modesty and candor and selflessness uh, that Governor Landon had has been passed on to his daughter, uh, Nancy. And the very first Landon lecturer, of course, was none other than Alf Landon himself. And the very first line in his lecture remains remarkably true today. He said, we must face the challenges of new realities of international life. And I think I should etch that statement in stone and mount it right on my desk over in the Pentagon, because it describes my job as Secretary of Defense. The realities may be different, but the challenges are quite the same. They still require the United States to be engaged in the world with strong diplomacy backed by strong defense. And I'd like to devote my Landon lecture to a central aspect of the challenge of maintaining that strong defense in a time of great expectation but uneasy peace. And I should tell you, I, I spoke yesterday at uh, Fort um, Leavenworth, and uh, I told the story about my uh, son's experience. He went to school where I went to school, Bowdoin College, uh, many years ago. And he was a senior uh, when he was about to graduate. And there was a very popular, the most popular professor in, on the Bowdoin College campus, happened to be a professor of religion. And he was the most popular, not because he taught religion, but because he always asked the same question every year on the final exam. <laughs> and the students, of course, loved him for it. They would wait until the final night, and they would sit up, and they would cram all night long, and they'd go in, and they would ace that final exam. Because the question always was, discuss the wanderings of St. Paul, except my son's senior year. And he walked into the classroom with his <laughs> classmates. They looked down at the exam. Within 30 seconds, they had tremors. Uh, most were nauseous. Uh, within a minute or two, all but one student left the room because as they looked down, it said, discuss the meaning of Christ's Sermon on the Mount. And so with the one student who sat there, and he wrote, and he wrote, and he wrote for the full three hours to the astonishment of his <laughs> professor. And he finally, at the end of that three-hour period, closed his blue books up. And he walked over and he passed the exam in to his professor. And he turned around and he walked out with what Mark Twain would call the calm confidence of a Christian holding four aces. <laughs> and the professor looked down at that exam and it said, to the experts, I leave the meaning of Christ's Sermon on the Mount. As for me, I should like to discuss the wanderings of St. Paul. <laughs> So I'd like to wander a little bit with you today and talk about some military issues. Um, this morning I toured uh, Fort Riley and I watched an Army platoon train for field combat. Uh, they were trying to make the training exercises more realistic and each soldier and tank and troop uh, carrier uh, was fitted with a laser device that rings an alarm bell if somebody aims and fires at them and it's kind of similar to that arcade game uh, laser tag. But this wasn't a game. Uh, this was real business. This was serious business. Uh, if, for example, North Korea should suddenly attack the South, these soldiers would have to leave Kansas, fly across the Pacific, and charge into combat, braving a hail of hot steel and the flash of bursting mortars. This training is going to help these soldiers return to Kansas alive, whole in mind and body, with mission accomplished. And I went to visit uh, the soldiers in training for a very good reason. As Secretary of Defense, it's important for me to go out and meet the soldiers, to look at them in the eyes, 
the men and women in uniform. Because every week, uh, I can change, and I do change their lives in a moment's notice. Every week, I have to sign deployment orders. And they're brought to my desk on a regular basis. They may involve a few people. They may involve several thousand. But they're people your age, and I send them into sometimes very dangerous and often deadly situations. Some of them may never return alive. They risk their all to protect our national security, which for some remains quite an abstract concept. And yet they go willingly. Why? Well, some go for duty, some for honor, some for country, some for esprit de corps, for the team, for the friends beside them. But all of them have committed their lives to something important and precious, and their lives are important and precious to me. And when I served on the Senate Armed Services Committee, I always tried to take into account these troops and everything that I did. And when I became Secretary of Defense last January, I pledged to protect and defend the members of the armed forces who protect and defend our country. And my heaviest duty is to care for the troops and to employ them wisely. And my highest privilege, I must tell you, is to engage with them every day, which I do. When I walk into the Pentagon, I walk into a building that is filled with 23,000 people, and I am inspired by them day in and day out of the kind of selfless dedication and hard work and intelligence and competence that they bring and sacrifice uh, for the public good. But I must tell you it's a fewer privilege, it's a privilege I should say that fewer Americans today enjoy. And it raises some important questions. How many Americans today have a family member or a good friend in the military? Uh, how many have come into close contact with a soldier, sail, sailor, airman, or marine in the past month or so? And what were their impressions? Uh, how many know that on any given day we have troops in more than 100 countries and sailors on every ocean in the world? And how many know exactly what they're doing? Fewer and fewer Americans are following what we're doing. Fewer know that we spend approximately $250 billion on an annual basis to maintain a strong, ready, deployable force, a standing force. And this trend is somewhat understandable. The U.S. military is smaller. In the past 10 years, we've cut approximately 800,000 troops out of our force structure, giving us the smallest force we've had since 1950. The military is less dispersed across America today, so we have closed hundreds of military facilities. The military creates fewer civilian jobs today. We've cut spending on new planes, ships, tanks, arms, and we have eliminated nearly two million civilian defense workers. The military is drawn from a smaller pool. We no longer, of course, have a draft, and our volunteers tend to be people who are already interested in serving in the military. And we're at peace when the military activities seem less dramatic and they attract less attention. It's this very existence of peace that tends to obscure the need to protect and nurture those who secure it. The peace is often said to be like oxygen. When you have it, you don't think about it. And when you don't have it, it's all you think about. Because we have peace today, we tend not to think about the sacrifice that the men and women who serve us are making or the successes that they are achieving in order to ensure that we have peace today and, and that uh, for tomorrow. So when the military, like any large, diverse organization, experiences problems, the problems tend to be magnified out of proportion and they distort the true picture of the military itself. It's a picture which can change rather quickly. Uh, not long ago, there were several prominent uh, journalists, students of military uh, studies, who were wondering if the armed forces were too good for America whether their standards were too high or too rigid or out of touch with the new age and the new morality. And there was speculation that perhaps the military is becoming too elitist and they might look with contempt or disdain upon the rest of society. Because in general, military personnel are better educated, more disciplined, they have higher standards than most of their civilian counterparts. More recently, the media fixation on the social issues that are facing the military, uh, the critics in the face of this are now asking different types of questions. They're now asking, are the armed forces good enough for America? 
And it's important that we answer this question with a resounding yes. The military's social issues are America's social issues, issues that are gripping corporations and communities across the nation. Social issues are easier to grasp than security issues, and they're more sens sensational. Uh, one TV reporter was quite candid when admitting that if he can produce a story that has the word sex and the word military in the same sentence, he's almost guaranteed of making it on the evening news. Which is not to say that the military is pure or perfect. In an organization this large, this diverse, there are always going to be problems. There are 1.4 million members of the military on active duty, and if it were a city, the military would be the sixth largest city in America, just behind Philadelphia. Would we define Philadelphia by the actions of a few lawbreakers? Would you allow a few problem students, if you have them, to find Kansas State University? Being human, members of the military sometimes are going to fall short of the military standards. And as Adlai Stevenson once said, it's often easier to fight for principles than to live up to them. But while harassment and abuse and misconduct have occurred in the ranks, those breaches of faith are the exceptions and not the rule. And as most service men and women are going to tell you, these incidents really don't paint a true picture of service in our armed forces, or the service that our armed forces are providing to people the world over. Yes, we need to fight abuse and harassment in the ranks, and we are. And yes, we need to treat the ranks with dignity and respect, as General Reimer and Secretary West reiterated yesterday, and we're going to demand that we measure up to our stated ideals. And yes, we have to hold the military to higher standards of conduct and values. The military holds itself to higher standards. And the reason that our military is the best in the world is because they refuse to accept the least. And so our challenge, it seems to me, in peacetime is to prevent any chasm from developing between the military and the civilian worlds, where the civilian world doesn't fully grasp the mission of the military and the military doesn't understand why the memories of our citizens and civilian policymakers are so short, or why the criticism is so quick and unrelenting. First, I think it's important that Americans see the military very clearly, because it's serving all of America. Second, the military has to continue to attract the best and the brightest people in our country, because people need to operate very highly complex and uh, difficult technology to conduct dangerous missions. We need the best and brightest in our military in order to carry out these missions. I have the honor of helping to lead a capable military in a secure nation, and my first obligation is to keep them that way. So if there's a gap in understanding, let me try to close it by giving you an accurate picture of the military today, what they do and why. And I'm not directing this so much at this audience because you, most of you, if not all of you, know the contribution that our military makes. But it's something that has to be said over and over again to a much wider audience. One recent article noted that military service is often a story of personal sacrifice, of families uprooted, of births missed, of holidays spent far from home. And these hardships are all endured in the spirit of service. We're also encouraging our people to expand their minds well beyond the military. Almost half of our officers have earned their master's degrees or doctorates. And when you re-enlist in the Army, you're given six months off to earn college credits. I'll give you a, a more personal example. There's a master sergeant named Marshall Williams who helps to run my Pentagon office with the same smooth rhythm that he runs eight miles every morning before dawn. By night, and by night I mean he comes in uh, by six o'clock in the morning, he starts running at four o'clock in the morning, uh, he leaves by 9 o'clock in the evening, and so when I say by night, he's studying for his fourth master's degree. He's only a dissertation away from becoming Dr. Williams, although his six-year-old son is still going to call him dad. He's one of the many remarkable unsung heroes who make up our military. And today, the military looks very much like America, with men and women from every region, race, and religion. We have more women at every rank, from privates to generals, who are shattering the glass ceilings and taking charge. We have more people of all races breaking barriers, seizing the opportunity that the military affords to excel, the opportunity that every American deserves. And as President Clinton said in his landmark speech on race relations, the best example of successful affirmative action is our military. 
And so today's forces, they also give back to the communities that host them a great many contributions on their own time, just as many of you in this auditorium today do as well. I'll give you a few examples. A sailor just received an NAACP service award for reaching out through his church to a South African community that needed help. A Marine is raising money to help abused children by running a string of marathons from North Carolina to Martin Luther King Jr.'s gravesite in Atlanta every day for three weeks. An Air Force sergeant in North Carolina operates an emergency shelter for homeless men. And when a soldier returned to North Dakota from Bosnia this summer, he waded through floodwaters to rescue stranded neighbors. These stories are not rare exceptions. They are the rule. Volunteerism is an American military tradition. And military officials, they also contribute to our society in another way. Like a business executive, many have run an office, they've met a budget, and they cut costs. And like a teacher, many have shaped others by sharing their ideas and their ideals. And the fact is that people leave the military better citizens than when they arrived. And at a time when we're worrying whether society is giving young people a strong beginning and solid values, the military is doing precisely this every day. And I have witnessed the tears of joy in the eyes of parents when their son or daughter finishes their basic training and they ask, how, how did you do this? How did you transform my son or my daughter in a period of eight or nine or 10 weeks how did you do it so fast and so well? I don't recognize my son or daughter any longer. And they are amazed at the transformation that takes place in a short period of time. And that's why the United States remains the best armed forces in the world. This is not rhetoric, it's a simple fact. But there still are many uh, who might question this, maybe on this campus, I doubt it, but some. Why do we have to maintain such a vigorous or vital, expensive military in a time when there's peace? Ultimately, the, question is we, the answer to that question is we have to be ready to fight and win wars or conflicts that we can't prevent through diplomacy. And we have to be ready to maintain the peace by projecting stability and assuring our friends and deterring foes in what still can be a very dangerous and hostile world. And so today's military provides for stability. The soldiers in South Korea who sleep in their uniforms and they're ready to jump out of their bunks at an hour and arrive at the front line uh, at a moment's notice. The peacekeepers in Bosnia who face mobs of stone throwers who are incited by desperate local thugs. The sailors who are manning destroyers who are threading the Straits of Hormuz keeping the lifeblood of the world economy flowing freely. The fighter pilots who live in tents in the searing Arabian desert who are patrolling the skies to keep Saddam Hussein's warplanes on the ground. And the tank soldiers at Fort Riley on a two-week training exercise, pulling all-nighters and catching an hour's sleep next to their turret, preparing for the real thing, if that call should ever come. Today's military is also serving to shape the world for the better, to silence the wars of drum before they begin to roll. And actions that are both sensible and selfless, they bring more stability to more regions, more democracy to more nations, and thus fewer threats to our interest. Now, why are these military actions so important today? Uh, just a few short years ago, we saw the crumbling of the Berlin Wall, the fall of the Soviet Empire, and there was an academician named Francis Fukuyama, and he wrote a thesis called The End of History. And that prompted an academician from South Africa, Peter Vale, to say, Rejoice, my friends, or weep with sorrow. What California is to today, the world will be tomorrow. And of course, uh, Fukuyama's thesis ran into some opposition right away, saying, wait a minute, it's a bit overstated, and perhaps it was. But the fact is that we stand at a pivot point in history. On the one side, we have momentous opportunity with flourishing markets and breathtaking technologies and brave new democracies. And on the other side, we see these startling new dangers of rising ethnic conflicts, of regional aggressors, the threat of international terrorism, the threat of the use of biological and chemical warfare, not overseas, but right here at home. 
And so it is our challenge, the American challenge, to move beyond this post-Cold War mindset and to somehow reorient ourselves for a new century to really take advantage of the new opportunities and avoid the new dangers. But underpinning all of this is the essential requirement that we remain engaged in world affairs to influence the actions of others, friends and foes, all of whom can affect our national well-being. But there are some of us in this society who would say, look, time to pull back. We've done enough. Uh, what does it mean to be a, a global power? Let's just take care of America. Of course, uh, we have learned the lessons of this century, that when America neglects the problems of the world, the world simply brings those problems to the doorstep of America. We can't walk away from the world because the world won't walk away from us. And so the road of isolation and apathy leads to instability and war. And no one understood the dangers of isolationism better than Alf Landon, who devoted his lecture here some 31 years ago to a call for American leadership in the world. He said we should respond to the new nationalism and other new challenges in international relations in our continuing search for world peace. Well, today the United States has greater opportunity and greater ability to influence world peace than perhaps any time in recent history. And that great task is made more imperative by the fact that technology today has miniaturized the globe. You think about it. Technology has miniaturized the globe to the point where the world is not much bigger than a ball spinning on the finger of science. Those vast oceans have been reduced to mere ponds. Um, countries that were once distant are almost as close as nearby counties. We can't afford to zip ourselves into a continental cocoon and watch the world unfold on CNN, or maybe even C-SPAN, who might be here today. Centuries ago, Archimedes discovered the secret behind the lever, and he declared, give me a place to stand and I will move the world. Well, today we have earned the power of Archimedes. The place where we stand is the sole global power in the world, a beacon of hope to free people around the world. And from this position of strength and influence, we can move the world in a better direction. How will we move it? What is our lever? It's the persuasiveness of our ideals, which are being embraced the world over. It's the creativity of the private sector, which is integrating the world in a way the government could never do. It's the persistence of our diplomats who reinforce our ideals in the cause of peace. It is the power of our military to shape the world to respond to threats, not simply for the betterment of ourselves, but for the betterment of others. And it's this military that's made up of people who are willing to give life and limb for the benefit of all of us that makes us the most powerful, and I would add the most envied nation on the face of the earth. I recall reading a book many years ago before I got into public service. It was called uh, The Recovery of Confidence. It was written by John Gardner, former secretary of what was then called HEW. And there was a segment of the book, a portion of the book that stayed with, has stayed with me for a lifetime. He said the problem in this country is that our institutions have become caught in a savage crossfire between unloving critics and uncritical lovers. And you have to pause and think about what he was saying at that time, that at one end of the spectrum, we have people who are so critical of our institutions who see no redeeming features in them. They're simply willing to tear them down with no recommendations of what to replace them with. At the other end of the spectrum, there are uncritical lovers, people who are so enamored with the status quo that they will do everything in their power to nullify and blunt, stultify any hope for change. And what the call was for all of us to become loving critics, willing to stand by those ideals, principles, and standards which have served us well over the centuries, but also open-minded enough to invoke change, embrace change, take in new ideas when we need new ideas, to constantly replenish ourselves so that we don't have a situation where you have a stagnant pond and you know in a stagnant pond there's death and decay. But if you have a moving stream that is open at both ends, that you have life and regeneration, open at one end to take in new ideas and the other end to slough off the old ones. And so each of us, when we look at the problems that befuddle us, that confront us on a daily basis, we have to look at them with this loving critic spirit in mind. Um, 
Let me close. Uh, I think it was George Jessel who said, if you don't strike oil within three minutes, stop boring. Uh, I prefer uh, Lord Mancroft, who said, a speech is like a love affair. Any fool can start one, but it takes considerable expertise to end it. <laughs> and I would uh, prefer to end it with uh, someone else's words, uh, those of Winston Churchill. And I found those words not in uh, Churchill's biographies and not on the, in the books that have been written about him, uh, William Manchester's uh, Lion series, but rather in a book written uh, by Stuart Alsop, a noted journalist who died some years ago. Uh, he talked about a chance encounter he had with Winston Churchill and they sat around back in the 60s. And uh, during the course of dinner, they had some wine. And after dinner, they had some champagne and um, perhaps even a touch of brandy. Uh, at the end of this session, Churchill looked over to Alsip and he said, America, America, a great and strong country, but w one that's willing, like a workhorse, to pull the rest of the world up out of the slough of despair and despond. And then he looked directly at Alsip and he said, but will it stay the course? Will it stay the course? And I can tell you that 50 years of history has answered that. We have stayed the course uh, because that is our legacy. And we will stay the course because that is our destiny. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Secretary, for a wonderful presentation. He has agreed to answer some of your questions here today. And as usual, we have microphones to your left or to your right. And so if you would have a question, would you please proceed to the appropriate microphone? Hey, we'll start over here on the left. Go ahead. Hello, Mr. Secretary. My name is Patrick Broderson. I uh, work here at the university, but I'm also a, a naval reservist, and I drill in Topeka, Kansas. I was wondering what your views are on uh, integrating and uh, utilizing the reserve force more closely with the active duty forces. Uh, I am a strong advocate of greater integration. Uh, I think we have to have uh, a one-team um, spirit. And we have to have a seamless integration between the active forces and reserve forces. Uh, I think that we have done uh, extraordinarily well in terms of uh, Navy uh, and Air Force. I think that we have had uh, some um, difficulties in terms of the Army. That is being addressed. We had a very good off-site uh, meeting with General Reimer and Togo uh, Secretary West uh, last spring. And I believe that uh, we are now working toward uh, full integration uh, at the, uh, the Army Guard Reserve level as well. So it's a concept that uh, I strongly support, is uh, receiving strong support um, with the, the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Okay, then we have a question right over here. My name is Mason McGarvey, and I'm a sophomore at Kansas State University and an Air Force ROTC cadet. My question is, do you think we could find a balance somewhere between uh, isolationism and ongoing and being involved in, in ongoing regional conflicts such as Bosnia and uh, and in hot spots in the Middle East and um, and a second part to that question could you please discuss uh, Bosnia more in depth and how your views compare with upper, upper military staff in Washington thank you sounds to me like you're studying for journalism you asked a follow-up question without even letting me answer the first question <laughs> but, um, but it was a they're both very good questions. Uh, is there a balance that has to be struck? Uh, I wish uh, Senator uh, uh, Roberts were up here on the podium with me, and perhaps uh, also um, Senator, I still will say not former, but Senator uh, Nancy uh, Kassenbaum Baker. Uh, uh, Pat had contributed to a, um, a publication that tried to outline this issue. 
when is it that we should make a decision to uh, send our forces uh, on missions and what kind of missions? Uh, obviously, we have a series of things we look at. We should deploy our young men and women uh, uh, to uh, areas when there's a vital national security interest involved. Everyone here would agree with that. Uh, when it's really vitally important to us, when our future security is at stake or that of our allies, uh, then obviously we have a commitment to, uh, to, to uh, contribute to and to keep. We have important national security interests that are not vital, but they're important. And then we go down the line and we start dealing with uh, humanitarian operations uh, or peacekeeping missions. And we have to start making uh, judgments in terms of how many such missions can we afford to send our troops uh, to, uh, uh, to contribute to. Uh, we have to be selective in my judgment. We have to exercise a good deal of selectivity because there are many missions that uh, other nations will call upon us to contribute to. Uh, and if we are going to remain the superpower that we are, given the fact that we're unlikely to see significant increases in budgets in the future, and this is something that perhaps one uh, can be criticized for, but I believe we're looking at uh, stable uh, or level uh, funding for the future years, unless there is a conflict in which you can expect defense spending to go up. But my own judgment is we're likely to see a relatively stable level of funding. So given that reality, we have to be much more selective in terms of where we contribute our forces and send them. There may be times when you will see a failed nation, a failed state, where everything collapses. There's no government, there's no water, there's no electricity, there's no infrastructure, people are starving. There will be calls upon the United States to help, and we should, with the understanding that we're there temporarily until the bare minimum can then be provided to those people. And we do that. We have to be very careful on peacekeeping missions, and that brings us to the subject of uh, Bosnia. The President has, uh, along with our NATO allies, has committed our presence to Bosnia to June of 1998, S-4, the uh, stabilization force that we currently have. At some point in time this year, we will hopefully go down to a deterrent force. Uh, my hope and expectation is that the S-4 mission will be completed by June of 98. Uh, I've indicated this before, that I believe the military mission has already been completed. Dayton's military uh, mission as such has been completed. The civilian implementation of Dayton has not. You're seeing a more aggressive pursuit of the Dayton Accords today than you have in the past, and that's because we have put pressure on ourselves and upon our allies saying, we're looking at June of 98, we have a lot to do between now and then, let's get to work and cooperate with each other and try to intensify our actions to raise the money that's necessary in terms of putting capital into that uh, war-torn country uh, to help uh, build the infrastructure, to help the resettlement of refugees. Let's help uh, do what we can between now and June. That is my hope and expectation. That's what President Clinton uh, has said. Uh, are there differences on this? And the answer is yes. Our European friends want us to stay much longer. Uh, they do not feel that a mission can possibly be completed by that time, and that if we are not uh, involved, they will not be involved, and the war will restart. Uh, that debate will continue throughout the year. I suspect it will continue uh, for a good many more years in terms of uh, how long there should be uh, foreign forces who are helping to secure the peace. My job at this point is to try to keep to that schedule, to recommend uh, actions that will allow us to start downsizing as we go through the year, to keep the commitment that S-4's mission will end in June of 98. It is not by any means a settled issue. There are resolutions pending in Congress. In the House, there is a resolution that would mandate an exit by June of 98. The Senate has a sense of the Senate resolution. Uh, I think it is bad policy for Congress to mandate an exit date uh, from Bosnia or any other country. I believe that that is a prerogative that should remain with a commander in chief. And so the President has indicated with my support that he would veto uh, any mandated exit from Bosnia. But uh, that is, I think, is acceptable is to have a sense of the Congress that we should be uh, re uh, eliminating uh, our presence or reducing our presence uh, and uh, completing our mission by uh, June of 98. I think that would be acceptable constitutionally, but I think it would be an error to mandate an exit date uh, by, by the Congress itself. 
Uh, in the future, I think we have to husband our treasure. We need to begin very selective. And in my position as Secretary of Defense, uh, to give advice to the President of the United States, who's the Commander in Chief, the best possible advice, working with the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs and the Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, uh, to bring the best possible advice we can bring to the President so that he can make those final decisions. I could give you a much longer answer, but there are other people waiting to. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I spent 10 years in the infantry, and I appreciate your kind remarks this evening. But since George Washington can't speak today, I'll speak for him. He said, no entangling alliances. Be friendly to all, friends of none. President Clinton said we would spend $2 billion in Haiti. It's now common knowledge we've crossed the $10 billion mark, and Haiti is in no better shape than it was. He said two and a half years ago, we'd be out of Bosnia in 12 months. You just said you hope to be out in 12 months. And how much has that cost us? And you can look, you know, the, the whole issue is it's not these individual situations. It's what is the goal of our government? Is it to defend the Constitution or is it to be social workers with shotguns, respectfully? Of course, we say no foreign entanglements, uh, no uh, uh, relationships. Uh, you have to qualify that. We have something called the NATO alliance. Uh, how many here would like to maintain the NATO alliance in the form that it is today? Perhaps uh, the most successful military institution that we uh, have had in recorded history. The NATO alliance as such has preserved peace and stability on the European continent. Uh, and so we want to say we want to maintain that relationship. Now, there's a debate that's going to take place in the United States Senate next year. Should we expand NATO? Do we help secure more peace by expanding NATO membership to bring in countries who have labored under the heel and boot of Soviet domination for so many decades, who are now free and democratic, who want to be associated with us? Uh, should we bring in Poland? the Czech Republic, Hungary. That's the vote that was taken by NATO to bring them in. Will that bring more peace and stability? I believe that it will, but that's a subject of legitimate debate. Uh, and so we have to uh, be more dis discerning and discriminating. We say no foreign entanglements. Uh, do, should we have a foreign entanglement with our allies? Of course. Should we embrace more allies? If you can produce more peace and more stability, then there is I think a valuable interest to be served in doing that. Now, will uh, NATO membership uh, produce more stability? I think it will. Uh, I think to the extent that you have other countries who are now saying, how can we be more like the United States? How do we have interoperable equipment? Can we train with the US military? Can we train with NATO? Does that build more stability in those countries? I think it does. And what have we learned through uh, this century? When you have instability, uh, you have war. And when you have war in Europe, you do not have peace in the United States. Each time there's been a war in Europe, the United States has been called upon to engage in those wars in World War I and also World War II. So we have to, I think, to be uh, more discerning. Uh, foreign entanglements, are we entangled with Haiti? No. Uh, was there a problem with uh, a country that was collapsing with thousands of people who were starving or being uh, um, abused, killed, and yes. Were they trying to get to our shores? The answer was yes. Should we do something about it? And the answer was we should try to make some minimal contribution at least to stabilizing that country that is so close to our borders. Now the fact is we can't seal ourselves off from the rest of the world. It would be nice to live in George Washington's day when you had the protection of the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific. But what I mentioned during my opening remarks, technology has eliminated all that. Technology has eliminated all that. The ocean doesn't protect us anymore. We could be evaporated in 29 minutes if we had an ICBM coming from the so former Soviet Union or from China, should that ever occur, from any other nation that now is now acquiring uh, this proliferation of missile technology. So the world has become miniaturized. Everything is very small today. Technology has revolutionized everything. 
It's in our interest to be engaged in a constructive fashion. It's in our interest, for example, to maintain our relationship with Japan. We now are going through a revision of the U.S.-Japan defense guidelines. Why are we doing that? Because we have a commitment to South Korea, by way of example. We have 37,000 American troops in South Korea today. Pat Robinson just came back from North Korea as well as South Korea. It's a very dangerous region. We don't know what's going to happen from day to day. We hope, we hope that somehow we can persuade the North Koreans to move off their war footing path that they've been on for so many decades and to somehow come to a more peaceful relationship with the South. But it's, no one can tell you what will happen. We have to be prepared to defend that. We have to have a relationship with Japan so that we can reinforce our troops in South Korea. So it doesn't become so simple to say, let's just not be entangled. The world is very small. The way in which we preserve American security is by being out there, um, being forward deployed. I went to Japan, to Tokyo, and to South Korea, and I reassured those leaders, the United States will keep roughly 100,000 troops forward deployed throughout the Asia Pacific region. Why? Because we are a stabilizing force for that region. We have stabilized the region. There is no arms race taking place. There is stability, and guess what? There is also prosperity. And we are sharing in that prosperity. China itself is allowed today to be prospering. Why? By virtue of American presence in the Asia Pacific region. Because China hasn't had to worry about a militarized Japan or other ASEAN countries suddenly starting to um, build their militaries and possibly threaten them. So everybody has benefited by our stabilizing influence. And we too have benefited as a result. Many people think it's foreign um, giveaways that we're simply uh, giving foreign aid to countries that uh, are, are not our friends and not in our interests. Quite to the contrary. As a result of our presence and our military commitments, we have stabilized regions which were unstable. We are creating prosperity, and we, the American people, are sharing in that prosperity. Yeah. So, uh, the time for two more. As much time as you need. Really? Whatever you need. Well, let's try about two more questions, one here and then one over there. Hello, my name is Heather Ryan. I'm a junior here at K-State and also an Army brat of 20 years. Uh, my father is stationed at Fort Leavenworth. You stayed across the street from my house last night. <laughs> uh, my question for you is how you think that we as young Americans and young adults can help portray the military in a more positive light and get more in touch with what with what the military life is all about and take more pride in what we do? Boy, what a leading question that is. <laughs> um, you know, it's a question uh, that uh, I really would like to address. It's something that is of concern to me. The military is the most respected institution in the United States. We tend to forget that. The United States military is the most respected uh, that we have in, in the country. There is a danger, however, that we see the sort of slow drip, drip, drip of criticism. Uh, yesterday you saw, many of you uh, saw a presentation by uh, General Reimer and Secretary Togo West about the problems that the Army has confronted. And to the credit of the Army, they said, look, we've had some problems at Aberdeen. Everybody knows about them. They could have just dealt with Aberdeen, but they went further. And the Army said, let's meet this head on. Let's find out if it's a deeper problem. If it's a deeper problem, let's propose some action to take care of it. And so I give uh, General Reimer and Secretary West a great deal of credit for being as open and candid and self-critical as they were, because recognizing there was a problem, they're going to correct it. But you have to start out with a different set of, of premises. Number one, we have the finest military in the world. Let me say it over and over again. What is most impressive to me is that I receive ministers of defense from all over the world. They come to my office sometimes two or three, sometimes five and seven a week in various periods of time, and they are coming into the Pentagon to say, how can we, how can you help us build our military to the same standards that you have? When I go out into the field and I visit our troops out into the field, I go out to find out what their problems are, are we dealing with their quality of life issues? Are they overstressed? Uh, are they being overutilized? 
Uh, is there uh, an ops tempo, first tempo, and are we operating at too high a tempo? What are the problems they're experiencing? Because I want to make sure that we continue to attract the very brightest people that we can and the best people that we can, not only to attract them and recruit them, but then to retain them. And when I go out into the field, uh, I can't tell you the measure of pride that I feel. Wherever I go, I see, be it in Hungary or Spain or um, Germany, wherever I go, Japan, South Korea, all over the world. And I was over visiting our troops in, um, in Saudi Arabia recently, and I wore a dark black suit, and it was 117 degrees uh, at the time. And I was standing up in front of a large group of our troops, and one of them said, why are you wearing this dark suit? And I said, I really want to feel your pain type of thing. I want to, I want to. I want to experience what you're experiencing on a daily basis, but the real answer was I had to go meet the, the king uh, after I finished my speech. But what I found when I go out there and I see I am so impressed with the talent of the people who are in our military today and their dedication and their sacrifice and their spirit. And most people aren't seeing this on a day-to-day -day basis. I have the privilege of seeing them. And so one thing, among others, that I want to do is to take this message to as many people as I can, be very proud of the people who are serving in the military. And yes, we have problems, and we've dealt with them. Every time we have addressed a major problem, it used to be racism back in the 40s and the 50s, early 60s. We had a serious problem in race relations in our military. We've dealt with that. We had a serious problem with uh, drug abuse, alcoholism back in the 70s, into the early 80s, and we dealt with that. And to the extent that there are problems on gender integration in our military and women are in the military to stay, they are going to have more and more opportunities. We could not operate our military without them. They are making enormous contributions and make up nearly almost 14% of the military today. And so whatever problems are generated by that, we will deal with. And we will deal with it forthrightly and candidly as we did uh, during that discussion yesterday. So my hope is that I can, uh, during the tenure that I have at the Secretary of Defense's office, to take that message to as many of the American people to say, okay, read the stories, understand them, but don't let that obscure the fundamental premise that I just uh, articulated. We have the best in the world, we are the envy of the world, and to the extent, uh, look at upon it as a strength. How many countries are willingly uh, are willing to open themselves up to self-criticism to the degree that we do. We do it on a daily basis, a regular basis. We look at ourselves, we see a problem, and we correct it. We will correct the problem as far as gender integration, and I am looking forward to Senator Nassimon Baker's uh, uh, panel's recommendation to me. But I must tell you, I am going to take uh, your question and go back out to uh, every audience that I can talk to and say, look at the big picture, Ask yourself, why is it that everybody calls upon the United States uh, for help when there's a time of crisis? And the answer is pretty obvious, because we're the best. As I understand your question, uh, it was um, rather than try to interrupt the uh, broadcasts that are now being promoted by the uh, Karadic uh, supporters uh, in Pale and uh, other parts of, uh, of uh, Bosnia, wouldn't it be better to have alternative programming? And the answer is uh, yes to both. Uh, we are, in fact, promoting alternative programming uh, for, um, uh, for the uh, supporters of Dayton, Mrs. Plotvich. Uh, also, we have found that uh, the supporters of Karadic have not abided by their agreement that they made uh, with our NATO commander and with the NATO uh, organization. And so uh, there is now uh, an effort underway to say, unless you comply by allowing uh, airtime for Mrs. Plotvich and her supporters, then uh, we are going to uh, interrupt your broadcast. The broadcast that have been coming out of those stations has been almost Hitlerian uh, in tone and content uh, and posing a, a threat even to our S forces um, because uh, the S4 uh, uh, components there are now coming into uh, citizens who have been energized uh, and antagonized by these broadcasts because of their vitriol, because of their lies and deceptions and so it has been determined that if they're going to continue to do that, uh, they will be interrupted. But in the meantime, we're also providing uh, alternative broadcasting for supporters of Dayton. Thank Let you. me uh, uh, conclude uh, my, uh, my appearance here by first uh, thanking you. I frankly did not expect to have a turnout of this magnitude. Uh, I 
truly appreciate um, your silence during my presentation, uh, that uh, you were listening to some of the things I had to say. Uh, and uh, just so that I can uh, tell you what a privilege it is for me to occupy this position. Uh, I left the Senate at the same time that uh, Nancy decided to leave the Senate. We both had 18 years uh, in public service in the Senate, and I had another six in the House, and I had four more before that local level. And I said, uh, time enough, it's time for me to go, to use an old expression, that I should try something different. And I was well uh, out of my uh, Senate office, had all of my books all packed up, I was getting a business card printed up, and I was eager to become a private citizen again. Uh, when I received uh, the most unusual of phone calls, and the phone call came from President Clinton, and he, uh, after a series of uh, meetings, uh, asked me to be his Secretary of Defense. And he did so, um, uh, I think, uh, to his great credit, to achieve a, a, an important goal. Uh, he picked me as a Republican, and he could have picked any number of Democrats. And I said, look, once I walk across that threshold, um, the Republican tag won't mean very much. Uh, there may be Republicans who resent the fact that I'm serving. There may be Democrats who resent the fact that I'm serving. It won't mean very much, he said. The thing that I really want to do is to try to build a bipartisan consensus for a strong national defense, and I hope you can help me do that. Uh, to his credit, uh, he was willing to reach across the aisle to pick a Republican uh, to serve in this position. Uh, it was one of those offers I really couldn't refuse. It's probably the, the greatest honor I could have to be in a position to represent uh, the U.S. military because I still believe, uh, and you understand this, that this um, represents the very best of America and that when we send those ships out and the sailors out and the airmen out and the Marines out, um, they are our diplomats. They're not just warriors, they're diplomats. When I go to Bahrain uh, or to Oman or to wherever I go, I remind all of our, um, our airmen and Marines and sailors I remind uh, all of the uh, men and women who are serving in our military, you're not just warriors, you're diplomats. And you have to conduct yourself and carry yourself because you are shaping the opinions of everybody you come into contact with. And from what I see when I go around the world, they're very impressed. They are very impressed with the product that we are putting out uh, in the, uh, the military. And so I hope that all of you feel the same way uh, and take the sense of pride uh, that I have and uh, let me express to you the, uh, the great honor it is for me to occupy this position for whatever time uh, I can and um, during the next three years to bring the message to the American people that uh, take great pride in the young men and women who are coming into our military because they are truly uh, the finest that we've ever had and they are in true, uh, truly uh, the envy of the world. Thank you. Thank you.